back in the mountains, a hillbilly, his wife, went in labor in the middle of the night. So as the doctor was called, he handed the would-be dad a lantern and said, you hold this high while I do my thing. So sure enough, in a few moments, a baby boy was brought into the world. But the doctor said, whoa, 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 keep that lantern up high. I think I see another one coming. So about three minutes later, a baby girl was now brought into the world. And the doctor said, ho, oh, your mission's not done yet. Keep that lantern up high. So a few more moments. Number three was brought into the world. And the man went to put the lantern down. And the doctor said, hold on. I think I see a fourth one coming. By this time, the backwoodsman scratched his head, looked in bewilderment, and he asked the doctor, you reckon it might be the light what's attracting him? <laughs> <clears throat> Some people in life just don't seem to get it, while others do. Would you turn to Luke chapter 7, and we're going to see one individual that doesn't get it, and another unlikely person that does. Luke chapter 7 in your Bibles, please. As you're turning to Luke 7, last week we looked at the life of John the Baptist, and Jesus wanted to set the record straight about his great servant. And then as Jesus culminated speaking about John the Baptist, he said in Luke 7, 35, but wisdom is justified by all her children. In other words, if the nation of Israel had practiced wisdom, they would have embraced the prophet of God, but they did not. How should you, my friend, and may I say my forgiven friend, you who have known what it is like to have your sin removed as far as the east is from the west, how should you model the wisdom of God? Think about that. Let me read to you our passage today. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know what kind of woman, what kind of manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven." For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's talk to the Lord. Father, we're clearly going to see one who didn't get it and another who did. Help us to be counted among those who get it by the end of the service. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would turn the light on for all of us, illuminate our minds. Father, we thank you that he guided Luke to pen the account that we have today. May he just lead us into all truth now, 
I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Simon is a, a Pharisee. He's a separatist, if you will. He is a religious separatist. And by the way, I don't know why he really invited Jesus to this meal. It didn't seem like he was uh, enamored with the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as they go to the reclining position, and don't think table here, everybody. You've seen Da Vinci's uh, painting of the Last Supper, and the apostles are sitting at a table. No. For special meals, they had a, a low table to the ground. And people would, if you will, put their head on their left hand like this, and the feet would be away from the table. That's how they recline. At times like Passover, they'd break out the triclinium, the three couches. But we know one thing for sure, they're at one of these low tables reclining. And it's so intriguing to me because as this is occurring, there is a woman who comes and she begins to weep at the feet of Jesus. How did she get in? Some commentators believe that there were handouts given to the poor so people that were quote-unquote indigents could come in. Others think that it's because it was like a celebrity meal where Hollywood loves to have the red carpet and everybody comes just to check out who the stars are who are attending the feast. Nonetheless, there is a woman who's here and she is weeping at Jesus' feet. And I wonder, had she recently come to Christ? Had she had just heard the King of Kings preach and was broken and now has placed her faith in Jesus Christ? The scripture says that she is a sinner. Most likely she was a prostitute. This woman came to understand who Jesus was and as a result doesn't hold back her feelings whatsoever. She is at his feet and she is weeping. And I want you to notice three acts that show her humility. How many of you, when God breaks you, run somewhere in private in order to weep? You don't want to gush in front of everyone, so you just go somewhere where no one else is there. Not this woman. She has been broken. She is moved by her emotions, and now she is weeping openly in front of all these important people. That's an act of humility. Number two, she began to wash his feet with her tears. And notice what her text says, and wipe them with the hair of her head. We have three verbs at the end of this verse that are all in the imperfect tense. Continuous action in past time. We find the first one here with she wiped them. She kept on wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. She broke custom. Jewish women were not permitted to let their hair down in public, but she is so moved that she lets her hair come down as she's weeping at his feet, and now she is starting to clean his feet with her hair. That's an act of humility. Not only this, but number three, she begins to kiss his feet. Phileo is our verb for love. You're probably familiar with it. Friendship kind of love. The word kiss is the same, but this has an intensifier on it. And she kept kissing the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, church tradition tells us that it wasn't unusual to have rabbis honored in such a way that people would kiss their feet. So I just have one request. When you're heading out of the church today, and ladies, particularly if you got red lipstick on, Please wipe it off if you get the shoe on the way out. I really appreciate that, okay? So don't hold up the line. Just, you know, do your act of homage and move on. I'm just joking with you. Now, that sounds awfully strange to us, does it not? But it wasn't in that time. She doesn't care what everyone thinks. She is adoring her Lord. And now she is also with the third imperfect tense verb, anointing his feet. She keeps on anointing his feet. You see, she has a container made of alabaster stone, and within that was either a costly perfume or ointment. Maybe it was the most valuable thing that she owned, and she gladly lavishes what she has upon her Lord. Hmm. <laughs> and here's Simon. You can almost see him put his hand on his hip. If he only, if he only knew what kind of woman this is. 
The if there is a second class condition assuming that Jesus didn't know. Simon doesn't think highly of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't understand what is going on. He doesn't get it at this particular point. And with this, let me give you point number one. Sinner, that's all of us, sacrificially worship and serve Jesus. Sinner, sacrificially worship and serve Jesus. Let me just walk you through another account real quick. You might recall 2 Samuel chapter 24. God had moved David to number the people of Israel. God was displeased with the nation of Israel. So in actuality, he allowed Satan to come in, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, entice David, much like Job 1, you know how God used Satan in order to test the character of Job. Same thing going on there. So David calls for Joab to come in and to number the people. It seemed like he was more interested when we get the numbers after Joab came back after months of the military might that David possessed. And once Joab, who didn't want to go on this mission because he understood the king's pride, goes and comes back, David's heart smites him. He understood that it was an act of arrogance. So what does God do? He dispatched his prophet, Gad. And Gad came to David, and this is the only time that I'm aware this happens in Scripture. He says, I'm going to give you three choices on the punishment that you can have. Can you think of any other occasion where you are asked what punishment you want? And David, being a wise king, didn't want to fall into the hands of men. I find it interesting. He said, I'd rather fall into the hands of God. So God struck, struck the nation with a plague. This was going to go on for three days. 70,000 Israelites died. So David's saying, Lord, what can I do? So Gad said, you need to go and offer a sacrifice and told him where to go. He would find a man by the name of Aruna. And as he was threshing wheat, David was to offer a sacrifice there to stop the angel of death from killing everyone. So as David approaches Aruna Jebusite in Jerusalem, Aruna says, hey, I'll give you everything you need. You can have the land. You can have the implements in order to do the sacrifice. And listen very carefully what David says in 2 Samuel, this is 24, 24. No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which does not cost me anything. In other words, ministry or worship that costs nothing are worth nothing. God wants us to sacrifice in our worship. God wants us to sacrifice in our service. As this woman understands who Jesus Christ is, she sacrifices maybe the most valuable thing she has to anoint him, to worship him, and to serve him. So number one, sinner, sacrificially worship and serve Jesus. Now let me build upon point number one with point number two, sinner sacrificially worship and serve Jesus lovingly for unpayable debt cancellation. We all have a debt that we could never pay off. And since our Lord Jesus paid the debt, we need to show our appreciation to him. Now, before Jesus plays, Simon says with Simon, yeah, we're going to see Simon says. That's kind of interesting here. With Simon, he says, Simon, I first have something to say to you. And I'm sure Simon's thinking, oh, he's a great teacher. He has some word of wisdom to impart. So Simon said, say it, master. Say it, teacher. And Jesus tells the story of two creditors. One who owed 500 denarii. Think about this. If you had 360 days in a year and it took you one day to earn one denarius, it would take you over a year, almost a year and a half, to pay back that debt if you put everything toward that debt. That's a lot of debt. And then there was another individual who owed 50 days of pay, 50 denarii. So Jesus says that the creditor forgave them both their debt. And I love what happens here because Jesus says, tell me, therefore, which of them 
will love him more. This is when Simon doesn't want to play Simon Says. Because God, in the person of Jesus Christ, is trying to communicate to his pharisaical heart that you are a sinner and that you need to be broken and you need to understand who this woman is because you should be more like her. So what does Simon do? And can you see him gritting his teeth? Can you see him just holding back from speaking? <laughs> he doesn't want to play, Simon says, and he says, I suppose catch it. I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Have you ever wondered where the game Simon says come from, by the way? The Latin version, Cicero disit fac hoc. That answers it all right there. Meaning, Cicero says do this. Apparently, Cicero was a political, powerful figure, and what he said went. Simon the Pharisee is an important person and carries a lot of weight as well. But may I say the one that we should be hanging on his every word is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to do exactly what he tells us to do. The woman, the sinner, understands what Jesus has done for her and has offered him everything that she had. And Simon who doesn't understand his own sin, who is self-righteous, who has his own standards. He just looks down his nose at this woman. And I love what Jesus does in verse 41. Do you see this woman? Do you think People Magazine would feature someone like this woman? What about those who are always telling us about the Hollywood celebs, TMZ and all these people, and they want to hold up the rich, the famous, the powerful, the pretty, the elite, the rich. And we have the Christians running to their feet, looking at them. Jesus said, and I'm sure Simon didn't appreciate it, do you see this woman? My dear friends, this is the kind of account we need to be thinking about because this woman totally humbles herself in the sight of the Lord and Jesus is pleased with her life. She becomes a model for all. How incredible is that? And then Jesus begins to lay out Simon. He said, you gave me no water for my feet. You see, because at a special meal, you would have somebody actually wash the foot, the feet of Another, right? John 13, where Jesus made himself the slave and washed the disciples' feet. That didn't happen here. But what did this woman do? With her tears and with her hair, she cleaned the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 45, she says, Simon, you didn't give me any kiss. It was customary that you would give the person who was attending your banquet a kiss on the cheek. Simon didn't do that. But yet, what does the woman do? She kisses the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ repeatedly. Jesus says, you didn't anoint my head with oil. Another customary feature that should have happened at this time. But what does this woman do? She anointed Jesus' feet with the fragrant oil. And then in verse 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. By the way, this woman's works didn't save her. We see in verse 50, it's her faith. But Jesus recognizes this, and he says, for she loved much. My friend, do you love much? Do you understand how much we have been forgiven? Or do we now, because we are Christian, and we have our own standards, see, the Pharisees not only had the law, but they had the additions to the law. And they liked micromanagement. If you will, the more laws, the better. And as they kept the laws and what was added to the laws, they just looked down the nose at everybody else. And this happens in the Christian community because we start going, ah, I show up for Sunday school all the time. I make morning worship. I'll go out and do this and that, and I tithe, and you can just add to the list, and you keep going on and on. And after a while, we do something that is very dangerous, my friends. We start measuring ourselves by ourselves, and we start comparing ourselves by ourselves. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, that's not wise. We need to have one standard and one standard only. The one that is perfect. And he is the one in Matthew 5, 48, where Jesus says, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you want to have a standard, 
May it be the standard of God. And as we look at him constantly, we see just how far, far short we come and we're humbled because we recognize even on our best day that our righteousness is as filthy rags in the presence of the Lord. I've been pondering now for a couple of years the Sermon on the Mount. And I think the driving verse for the account is in Matthew 5, 20. Jesus says, but I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus was saying to his disciples that you better not be imitating the Pharisees who have their own standards of righteousness, but rather turn to the one whose standard is perfect and follow him. That's what Jesus was trying to point out. Now, let me show you how this works out. Philippians chapter 3. Would you turn there, please? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Gentiles eat pork chops. Got it? Okay. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. And pick it up in verse 3. We used to say GE Power Company, but not nearly as exciting as Gentiles eat pork chops. Okay. Philippians chapter 3. Paul is under house arrest. It's approximately A.D. 61. And I love this. He keeps writing to these people that are free, and he says, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Don't you love somebody telling you to be joyful who has miserable circumstances, but knows that joy is not a byproduct of circumstance, but rather of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, for we are of the circumcision, speaking of the Jewish people, who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and I love what he says here, and have no confidence in the flesh. Can I ask you today, my friend, do you have confidence in the flesh? What is it that we're really depending upon? Verse 4. Paul says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Let me tell you why, says Paul. Circumcised the eighth day. See, he wasn't a proselyte. He wasn't a foreigner who just came to Christ later on. He's truly Jewish. And on the eighth day, the law said that's when the male son should be circumcised. And by the way, it's so fascinating. Guess what science now has understood? The coagulation of the blood is best on the eighth day for the son to be circumcised. Are we supposed to be surprised? I think God knows what he's doing, don't you? Right? So Paul says, circumcise the eighth day. I guess his mother had told him so. Anybody remember their circle? Okay, let's move on here. <laughs> of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Hey, if you want to boast, I'm from Benjamin. Guess where the first king came from? Saul. Benjamin. Mm -hmm. I can continue to boast. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. It's a Hebraism. Instead of saying something is good, better, or best, they didn't have superlatives in the Hebrew, you repeated it. So it's not the song of songs in the sense of just repeated songs. It's the best song. <laughs> The holy of holies is the most holy place, is the idea. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee. I obey the law. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. When he thought that the church was contrary to the Old Testament scripture, he went after those Christians. He locked them up, had some put to death. That's what he did. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Hmm. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. When he looked at all those things and now understanding that those were not the things that please God, he says, I've counted loss for Christ. Verse 8, yet indeed I also count, a present tense verb, keep on counting all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Has anybody given up all things for Christ? Has anybody lost everything because I identify with Jesus Christ? Paul goes, I did. Paul had it made. He was a scholar. He could have done very well in the community in which he lived. And when he turned to Christ, the community turned on him. Notice this. And count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. That word rubbish is very interesting. It can mean dung. I count them as dung. The other alternative understanding of the word is it refers to that which is thrown out from the table, maybe even given to the dogs, the scraps. 
Paul says, all those attainments that I had when I was walking in the realm of the flesh, I count them as dung. They are nothing. He says, those things are absolutely worthless compared to what I have gained in Christ. And verse 9, everybody, and please understand this. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God. And how do you want to get it? It's by faith. What did Paul understand when Jesus came to him and appeared to him? The one who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God took of his righteousness and now put it in our accounts so that we could be declared righteous, not because of what we do, but because of what Christ has already done. And my friends, I just want to encourage you to get in the presence of God like Isaiah did and to see the holiness of the Lord and the greatness of God and understand that when your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west, that we were the most vile of sinners. Paul in his old age says in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am. It's a present tense verb there. I am right now chief. In Romans 7, as he had struggled with really getting close to Christ, he says, wretched man that I am. How many of us are broken like maybe this prostitute because we understand just how vile we were and that when Christ came and he erased our sins, how awesome that was. Do we have an appreciation? See, because the person who is forgiven much loves much. That's the point of the 500 denarii versus the 50. When the greater debt has been erased, we should love more. But to whom little is forgiven, back in Luke 7, the same loves little. How much do we love? Let me give you an example. Remember Barnabas? <laughs> Great guy. When uh, no one would pick up on Paul because he had persecuted the church and thought that Paul was just trying to dupe Christians, Barnabas, the son of encouragement is what his name meant, came alongside of Paul, put his arm around him, says, I'll take you alongside, buddy. Come with me. And Barnabas discipled Paul. But when there was a famine in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 4, and the Jerusalemites were starving, certain Christians, if they had lands, they sold their lands. If they had houses, think about that. They sold their houses, and then they came and laid the money at the apostles' feet. See, it wasn't, I'm going to give, but only if I can control the money. Unless you can give me a pat on the back so everybody knows where it came from. They laid the money at the apostles' feet. And then there is one by the name of Barnabas, seeing the same poverty. And he had land, and he sold it, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Did he understand how much he was forgiven? And let me tell you, my friends, unless we're caring for our neighbor, we really don't understand the love of God. See, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, minds, soul, and strength. And likewise, on the same level, we love our neighbor as ourselves. Like the Samaritan, remember in Luke chapter 10, and we have the good Samaritan. No such thing as a good Samaritan. Samaritans were scumballs from the Jewish perspective. They were half Jewish. They were half Assyrian. You didn't go through Samaria. You went around it. So when Jesus tells his story, he makes the bad guy the good guy. And here comes the priest after a man had been mugged. And the priest passed by on the other side. And here comes the Levite who was taught the law in Leviticus 19 to love your neighbor as yourself. And he also passed by, and here comes the Samaritan. Not only did a Samaritan risk life and limb, because where were the muggers when he helped out? But he also took out of his own pay and gave a few days pay in order to care for that man. You see what it is, my friends? As we therefore have opportunity, as we have season, as we have the occasion, let us do good to all men but especially those of the household of faith. If we really love God, then we're going to care for our neighbor. And this is how we demonstrate. It's one thing, it's easy to say, I love God. He's invisible. 
but to lay your life down for another, to take of your goods, to take of your time, and to meet the need of another. That's genuine Christianity. This is exactly what Barnabas does, but then we have the hypocrites, do we not? who play follow-up in Acts 5. And the one thing that the Lord was not going to tolerate in the church was hypocrisy. So when Ananias and Sapphira saw all the accolades that were given to Barnabas and the others, they said, hey, we'll do it. It's the same thing, but we won't give all the money, but we'll pretend we did. And you know the story. Ananias walks in, and Peter said, you sell for so much, and yeah, I did. Boom, cut on dead. I wonder if they listen next time Peter preached carefully this message. I, I sort of think so. And then the wife comes in afterwards. Same thing. God can't stomach hypocrisy. When you want to watch Jesus turn red in the face, mad, look at Matthew 23 with the Pharisees and the scribes, and he lays them out. He doesn't like hypocrisy in us either. And then in verse 48, I love what Jesus says to this woman. Your sins are forgiven. Do you understand what that means? To deserve death and eternal separation from God and for God to take away all of our sin? Do we understand the depth, the meaning to know what it is like one day to stand before Christ, not for our sins? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is so explicit. We are going to be judged, each one for our works. We've already been saved. On the cross remain our sins, and because Jesus took them upon himself, so we'll be judged for those things we've done in the body. Do we understand just how forgiven we are? And if you do, my friend then you get to that place where you go, I'm going to imitate my Jesus. We are commanded to let a man deny himself, first aorist imperative, once and for all, to take up your cross once and for all, and to follow him continually once and for all. Do we understand how forgiven we have been? And if we do, there is no sacrifice that is too great to make for our Lord. This woman understands it, but then the other people, when Jesus had granted the forgiveness and says, your faith saved you, they all started to question, who is this? That he can even grant forgiveness of sins. So number one, sinner, sacrificially, sacrificially worship and serve Jesus. Ministry, service that costs nothing are worth Nothing. Number two, sinners sacrificially worship and serve Jesus lovingly for unpayable debt cancellation. Joe, you know I have certain songs that move you. I was talking with Nathan before the service that I love coming over here by myself because I just love to sing to the Lord. I actually sound pretty good by myself. You all know, might not know that out. When I'm here, I really sound good. But it's just, just something about singing. And you have certain songs that you just like to sing. And don't you? Don't you have those songs that just mean so much to you? One of the hymns I've always loved, Take My Life and Let It Be, by Frances Havergal. Tremendous woman of the faith. Let me read you a few stanzas. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite, would I withhold. Her prayer, listen to these words, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. She didn't take that lightly. In a letter to a friend in August of 1878, she wrote, the Lord has shown me another little step and of course, I have taken it with extreme delight. Take my silver and my gold now means shipping off all my ornaments to the church missionary house, including a jewel cabinet that is really fit for a countess, where all will be accepted and disposed of for me. Nearly 50 articles are being packed up. I don't think I've ever packed a box with such pleasure. You know, thou who preaches, you should not steal. Do you steal? 
One of the things that we've got to become, my friends, are practitioners of what we're telling others to do. The Pharisee was a hypocrite. He was only concerned with his own standards. The woman was a sinner who understood what Jesus had done. And as a result, she sacrificially worshipped and served him. Would you bow your heads? Would you take one moment?